Hi guys, I'm Maylin Dovan, certified athletic therapist and founder of Rehab U Movement and Performance Therapy. Welcome to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell. This week we're going to talk about deep diaphragmatic and belly breathing. Are they the same thing? Now you've heard me rant about cues and generalizations and that kind of stuff. If you haven't, have a look through the channel and you'll find some, some of my videos on bad cues. Now, the idea behind a bad cue is not that it's necessarily bad, it's just that if we keep using something but we haven't established the outcome that we want, we may get into trouble. I wanna talk about how we've um, focused a lot on belly breathing and the terms get mixed up. Is it deep breathing? Is it abdominal breathing, belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing? And people have run into problems because they've been told to, to, to breathe deep into the abdomen and focus on the belly, and this leads to people thinking that they need to restrict rib cage movement, okay? And little bits and pieces of that are true. It's just that if you don't look deep enough into it, like I said, you can run into problems. For example, we certainly don't want an apical breathing, someone who, whose breathing is very shallow and the secondary breathing muscles are very involved, sternocleidomastoid, uh, scalenes, pec minor, and then we get all of that breath in the upper chest and that creates a lot of excessive tone and tension and that can limit mobility, right? So we certainly don't want that. But that being said, deep, a deep breath doesn't mean that the rib cage should not move at all, okay? So a couple of things here. One, the diaphragm. The diaphragm is absolutely important and should be the prime, prime mover for breathing. But so are the external intercostals that lift, the, that elevate the rib cage, okay? So it's not that a deep breath should mean a complete absence of movement of the rib cage. And in fact, the best way to make sure that your breathing is diaphragmatic is to breathe through the nose because mouth breathing decreases the amplitude of diaphragm movement. So just breathing through the nose, long inhales and exhales is gonna stimulate and solicit the diaphragm, okay? But that's not to mean that the rib cage shouldn't move. As a matter of fact, the rib cage is a classic area of restriction and there's a lot of proprioception in the rib cage. So it's all within our advantage to mobilize the rib cage. And as a matter of fact, you've heard me say before that breathing is actually a natural mobilization for the rib cage and as such for the spine. So we need to tap into that. Now, this will bring me to say that when you're dealing with breathing, yes, you want to make sure that someone knows how to breathe, that they're not a shallow breather, that they can bring the, the, the breath deep. And that's probably your first, not probably, that is your first go-to. Learn, make sure that they learn to breathe properly, okay? After that, once they've, they've learned to breathe properly, you can manipulate breathing based on the client and based on what you need to do, okay? So there's room to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a couple of client examples and show you which breathing exercise I would use for each of those clients and why. Hey guys, thanks for watching our videos and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So client number one or posing as our client number one is our wonderful, beautiful Caroline, rehab you athletic therapist. So. Client number one is your typical client with the kyphotic posture, right? The depressed chest who maybe comes to see you because they've got trouble with their overhead mobility, okay? When someone is kyphotic, the internal inter intercostals are facilitated, so the, the chest is depressed. Now you can manipulate breathing for this person to focus on inhalation and chest elevation, right? to get them out of that posture. Because I could mobilize their T-spine like crazy, but if they're not tapping into that natural mobilization via the breath, I may be doing that for nothing, okay? So one exercise I like to use is a breath coordination where we time breathing with movement of the 
head, rib cage, and the pelvis. So Caroline, as she breathes in through the nose, the rib cage elevates, the pelvis tilts forward, and the head tilts forward, and she focuses on elevating that rib cage. And then when she exhales, she just relaxes. If I was trying to do the opposite and focus on the exhale, by the way, I could have her really focus on bringing the rib cage down as she exhales. Now we're focusing on inhale. So as she inhales, she focuses on bringing that rib cage up, tilting that pelvis forward, tucking the head, and then the exhale, exhalation is just passive. We're not gonna do a more active exhalation for someone who's already in this exhale position, right? So focus on inhale. As usual, breathing exercises, three minutes is your optimal minimum. If you really, really need it to cut it down, two minutes is my minimum. Client number two is also Caroline. <laughs> so client number two is our client. Think of the person who has lumbopelvic instability. Think of that person who tends to hyperextend and, and, and form lock their lumbar spine, for example, when they're squatting or, or deadlifting. Okay, so now we're more focused on keeping that lumbopelvic stability, keeping that canister closed, so that pelvic floor and diaphragm parallel. So now I would use 90-90 breathing. Right, Caroline is in this 90-90 position, so hips flex to 90 degrees, knees flex to 90 degrees, heels on the bench, and she can just put slight pressure on the bench with her heels, not enough to lift her pelvis up, but just enough to feel that she's active there. And then she's gonna focus on breathing and having that horizontal expansion. And now I'm not as focused on rib cage elevation and pelvis movement. I actually want her to breathe and control that, right? I want her to keep that neutral position of the pelvis even though she's pushing the heels down and getting a contraction, okay? So now I'm focused more on maintaining that closed can and breathing in that position. Okay, so a completely different approach from our client number one where we really wanted to mobilize. In the case of the client who already moves her pelvis too much, now I want her to lock it down, control it, and breathe through that movement. Okay, so two different exercises, two different clients. So again, guys, first order of business, make sure that your client is able to breathe properly, understands how to breathe properly, how to take a deep diaphragmatic breath. And after that, once they've mastered that, you can manipulate breathing based on what you need to do, what you want them to control, what postures you wanna get them into or out of. So hopefully that will help you when you're dealing with a, a chest, chest, a depressed chest person versus someone who tends to lock out their low back integrating breathing into their mobilization sequence to help get them out of those positions. We'll see you guys next week.